Hello everybody, welcome to the final day of our Christmas countdown and as you may be able to guess from the way I am dressed I don't normally come into town dressed like this uh, we are going back to the Victorian age we're going to be looking around some of Victorian Birmingham but most importantly I'm going to be reading to you from one of the most iconic Christmas stories that has ever been written and a Christmas story that has a very strong link to the place I'm standing. About Charles Dickens' famous A Christmas Carol. And in 1843, Dickens himself appeared on stage in this building, Birmingham's beautiful town hall, to give the first ever public reading, the premiere of A Christmas Carol. He did it on three consecutive nights with three consecutive levels of pricing at different levels so that people of all wherewithals and all levels of wealth were able to go and hear him reading. So I'm going to share some passages from A Christmas Carol with you and uh, I hope you enjoy them. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah! said Scrooge. Humbug! He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome. His eyes sparkled and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, Uncle, Uncle said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah! again, and followed it up with humbug. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be, returned the uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas! Out upon Merry Christmas! What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer? If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you, much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year, when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good, and I say God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail spark for ever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why, cried Scrooge's nephew, why? Why did you get married, said Scrooge? Because I fell in love. 
because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, Uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. So Dickens performed his Christmas carol on those three nights in 1843. In the town hall built in 1833, so a new building at the time, it was built for exactly that kind of thing. Big events, concerts, political meetings, lectures, whatever we may be. Ahead of us though are some of the later Victorian buildings of the city. In this case, our beautiful museum and art gallery with its clock tower nicknamed Big Brum and this was built in 1885 for the people of Birmingham so that they would be able to have access to culture and art from around the world and that was very much in line with a lot of what was happening at that time the Victorian age was one where public services started to become important and around the area that we're standing was once Birmingham's Victorian Public Library, one of its most important Victorian colleges, Mason College, which was the forerunner of Birmingham's university. And ahead of us we see the extension to that museum and art gallery. Now this was built in 1911 but it shows how much this idea of the Victorian age took off, that people would have access to art and historical artifacts and how popular it was because within 30 years they had to vastly extend the building and nowadays that original Victorian building is uh, just a part, a small part of the whole museum complex. Now what we see when we walk around our cities, of course, most of the Victorian buildings we see are the very grand buildings like this one, like the town hall, like the museum. Uh, and that'll be the same in, in pretty much any city or town you go to. Because most of the everyday buildings, the places that people lived, the places people worked, a lot of those no longer around, particularly the housing. Because while Birmingham was a very prosperous city thanks to its manufacturing in the 19th century. There was great poverty and hardship too. And they were issues that were of particular interest to those with an eye for social justice and social reform. And uh, one of those men who was very prominent in terms of that kind of thinking was none other than Charles Dickens. Dickens travelled around a lot. Uh, during his lifetime, he made really a lot more money from doing public readings of his books um, than, than he ever did from selling them, because it was still a time of relatively widespread illiteracy. Not that many people were having access to any decent level of education. That only came about in the 1870s, really, with the universal primary education. And so, of course, people's access to literature came through having it read to them. And public readings were very, very popular at that time. Public readings by the actual writer, most popular of all. And Dickens, you know, it was like a rock group going 
back out on tour, you couldn't buy T-shirts with the uh, list of the places he read out on the, the Christmas Carol 1843 tour, um, or I'm sure he would have been selling them. But uh, Dickens, as he travelled around, he did pay a lot of attention to the places that he was going, and he saw a lot of the inequalities, he saw the way that less well-off people in society were living and it was something that concerned him greatly and it was something that he wrote about extensively in his writings increasingly so the more he found out and he supported lots of different causes and projects that were aimed at uh, improving the lot improving the opportunities of poorer people and one such project came to be based in the building that we see in front of us where I'm going to be uh, doing our second reading in a couple of moments. This is the Birmingham and Midland Institute uh, which was founded with uh, donations from wealthy local people but also people from other parts of the country. Dickens was one of the major supporters and the Midland Institute was an adult education centre, one of the very first to be established. So what it did was to give people who had the ambition, had the aspiration and the ability to maybe uh, get better opportunities if they could only access them. It gave those people an opportunity to get more learning, to learn better reading and writing, to study sciences, to study history and to run all kinds of courses designed to benefit the population and to spread education and um, progress to those who hadn't had an opportunity to share in it. Uh, and it's something that Dickens was very much a believer in and in fact he was named the first president of the Birmingham and Midland Institute when it was established and it's here to this day offering lectures, it has a fantastic members library uh, and a great community space for learning for the people of this city. So in his Christmas Carol Dickens was writing very much about the difference between the attitudes of people with money like Scrooge and his employee the Cratchits and how they as poorer people lived. And this is their Christmas. Then up rose Mrs Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which were cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table. Master Peter Cratchit blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What has ever got your precious father then, said Mrs Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah, there's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Mrs Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times. Never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless ye. There's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. In came little Bob, the father, his thread threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Martha ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house, that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave, asked Mrs Cratchit, when she had rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to the heart's content? As good as gold, said Bob, and better. 
His active little crutch was heard upon the floor and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, to which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. At last the dishes were set on and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. And when she did, and when the long expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs Cratchit left the room alone too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cuts next door to each other. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quarter of ignited brandy and bedight with Christmas holly stuck onto the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding. Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last, the dinner was all done. The cloth was cleared, the hearth swept and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears! God bless us! which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone! said Tiny Tim, the last of all. So what we see in the story of the Cratchit's Christmas is that poor people tried their best. You know, they would save and save. 
they'd pay into savings clubs to try to be able to buy something like a goose or a, maybe a turkey for Christmas that would be as much as they could afford and they would make it up with cheaper foods like the stuffing and the, the potatoes and the vegetables. And then they'd try to get the nice ingredients to make a pudding. But we see they would often cook the pudding wrapped in a linen cloth in the laundry because that, they didn't have anything big enough to really cook the pudding in. They didn't have great cooking facilities like we have today. But people made the best of what they had. They went to a great effort and they were very proud of their achievements in uh, making a lovely family Christmas despite their lack of means. Now, one of the things that Dickens and many other Victorians were concerned with was to share the wealth. Not everybody, of course, but there was a great spirit of philanthropy that developed around Birmingham and other cities in the Victorian age. And the building we're looking at here is one example of this. One of the most beautiful buildings in the city, built in the 1880s, and it's the Birmingham School of Art, the Municipal School of Art. To this day, it remains very similar kind of function. It is now the art faculty of one of our universities. And this was built to provide education in art by donations by Victorian philanthropists. Two brothers called the Tangi brothers who were owners of a big engineering company and a lady called Louisa Ryland. Louisa Ryland was one of the great Victorian philanthropists of Birmingham. She inherited an absolute fortune, millions and millions in today's equivalent, from her father who left the entire wealth from his wire drawing business to her. She did not want to continue the business, so it wasn't something that was interesting to her, and she decided to use the wealth she had for public good. She invested money in many, many projects, educational projects, healthcare projects, particularly those for women of the city. She was the co-sponsor of this art college. She also gave land and bought extra land to create Birmingham's largest and still one of its most popular public parks, Cannon Hill Park. So Louisa Ryland was, but she was very modest. She never wanted the things to be named after her. And here on the art college, you find there's a big plaque, a very visible plaque on the outside to the Tangy brothers, but to Louisa Ryland, there's a much smaller plaque and you, you have to really look to find it. Um, so this spirit of philanthropy was something that people were encouraging. And it's one of the messages I think that Dickens was trying to get across um, in works like A Christmas Carol. The fact of people who have wealth and have means sharing it and trying to uh, be a little bit more charitable and considerate of those who are not so fortunate. And we see that very much at the end of this famous story. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? said Scrooge. He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. I'll show you upstairs, if you please. Thank you. He knows me, said Scrooge with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. He turned it gently and sidled his face in round the door. They were looking at the table, which was spread out in great array, for these young housekeepers are always nervous on such points and like to see that everything is right. Fred, said Scrooge, 
Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it, yes he did. The clock struck nine, no Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir, said Bob. I'm behind my time. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore... He continued, leaping from his stool, and therefore I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavour to assist your struggling family. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset. His own heart laughed and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. So I hope you've enjoyed these readings from A Christmas Carol, uh, one of our most beloved festive stories. And I hope you've enjoyed seeing a little bit of Victorian Birmingham and finding out a little bit of the background to the buildings we've seen and to their links to Dickens and the ideas in his books. Um, I've personally enjoyed following in the footsteps of such a, a great writer and uh, reading A Christmas Carol in public for you. Uh, I don't think Dickens used a Kindle but uh, we use the technology that's available to us. He wasn't being filmed on a gimbal either I don't think. So this brings us to the end of our festive countdown and I hope You've uh, had a lot of fun watching all of the tours and all of the videos and joining in with the different activities uh, that we've um, arranged for you during this season. And uh, I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas and uh, a wonderful New Year filled with lots of great friendship, lots of great community and lots of great virtual travel experiences together. Take care, everybody, and I'll see you very soon. Bye for now.